Ladies and gentlemen, yesterday, Gerard, also known as the completionist, made a 20 minute response yesterday in response to the Open Hand Foundation situation, where he threatened a potential lawsuit against me. He questioned my reporting, my character, and made severely contradictory statements in this response alone. If you see me reading, it's because I actually have a full prepared script, because these are, again, incredibly serious situations, and I wanna make sure that I explain uh, our side, my side, to the best of, of, of my ability. So to understand, what I'm addressing is very serious, okay? This is not drama, this is not a joke, these are all very serious situations. Now, in this entire response that he made, he basically admitted that the organization held on to the donation money that they were raising over the course of the last several years, it wasn't okay, and they finally donated less than a month ago as of the upload of this video. During several recent IndyLand events, press interviews, and podcasts, I went on record saying where the money was going to, and that the Open Hand Foundation had worked with various organizations. At different points, the Foundation had been in communication with, or considered several of them, but it was not appropriate for me to make such statements when final actions had not yet been taken. The Open Hand Foundation's goal was to make a large impact by donating the money to the right place. And a lot of the conversations that were had with various organizations involved the funds not being restricted or came with extremely high administrative costs. Look, any way you say this, action needed to be taken. And to that point, I'm sorry. I'm disappointed that I was not more straightforward regarding the foundation's timeline for making donations and that I made statements potentially implying donations were made when they had not yet been. It took too long for clear action to occur and I apologize for all of this. Now, I've been pretty vocal about waiting for a response from Gerard, and while I understand legal matters often put a gag into your mouth during incredibly sensitive situations like this, I was pretty surprised to see a response yesterday in general, but what was really wild to me was how some of the individuals, at least on Twitter, uh, and again, I don't use Twitter as an intelligent metric, actually took this as a somewhat exonerating response, when it actually paints more contradictions into the light. So I'm here to offer my response to Gerard's response with receipts, something that I personally believe Gerard did not do at all in his video. I never saw one bank statement, never saw one evidence of money flow. It was an entire story of me just taking him at his word, which I will once again prove in this video that you cannot take Gerard at his word. He has proven to be somebody that is deceptive. So let me explain exactly how this works. Gerard provided receipts in his video, okay? If you look at the description to his video, if you look carefully into the description, one thing you'll notice is it's mostly just links to the AFDD website, the IRS, and various definition websites when it comes to these specific donations, or I guess definitions of a restricted or an unrestricted donation, or how the IRS determines differences between private and public foundations. There are only four actual pieces of evidence provided by Gerard in these Google Drive links that are a autopsy report regarding his late mother, which honestly had no reason to come out. You've got got a uh, OHF termination of private status letter. You've got one letter that I guess, at least to me, looks like a continuance or something, which we'll get into, and an OHF audit letter by the IRS. So we're gonna look into each four of these pieces of evidence and see just how much new information and clarification and transparency that they really provide. Let's go. So I opened up this letter over here and I read this very carefully, okay? So this is from the Internal Revenue Service where basically they have a dear applicant. The applicant is Open Hand Foundation. We've received your notification of intent to terminate your private foundation under the IRC section 507B1B during the 60 month period listed at the top of the letter. That 60 month period is starting from January 1st, 2016 and it ends December 31st, 2020. So again, in this situation, we're gonna read all of it because this video will be long, but I'm gonna fill it with as many receipts and contradictions as I reasonably can. This letter could help resolve questions on your foundation status. Please keep it for your records. I wish we saw this letter less, you know, more than 24 hours ago. I wish this letter was posted on the Open Hand Foundation's website, a website that still does not have the AFTD, a website they gave $600,000 to uh, over a week ago, listed in their beneficiaries. This is a website that should have had this information plastered. If your golf event can have your tax ID letter easily accessible, this information should have been posted 
posted for me and anybody researching this to logically assess. Then I wouldn't even have to question your private and public charity. In his response video, he really touched upon that point when it wasn't really even that massive of a point. All right, I noticed that they probably should be filing a 990 form, a 990 EZ, because they are a public charity, right? That is what they want to go as. Why would they continue to file a form, the 990 PF, if they're no longer a exempt private foundation? And again, this letter, if I saw it, I would have just believed them. I would have been like, all right, it makes sense. You asked for a notice of change and the IRS listened to it. They even said, based on your proposed activities and support, we agree you can terminate your private foundation status. Literally, you told them that you wanted to run IndyLand, I assume, at a lot of these events. And they were like, sure, if that's how you want to run it, then you're not a private foundation. You're a public one. So they even say within 90 days after the end of your 60 month period, you must show you've met the requirements as a public charity described in IRC section section 509A12 or 3 for the 60 month period. If you show this, you'll be classified under that section for all purposes from the beginning of the 60 month period and thereafter. Gerard refers to the last section of this video where, or sorry, this letter, where he writes, you're required to file form 990 PF, return of private foundation or section 4947A1 trust, treat it as private foundation until you complete your 60 month termination and are classified as a public charity. In March of 2016, the IRS acknowledged the receipt for termination of private status and indicated to the Open Hand Foundation the necessary requirements the foundation must follow in order to comply with the IRS code. A copy of those notices are also down below with supporting IRS documentation. Further, based on the acknowledgement of the private status termination, the foundation was now required to operate like a public charity as described in the IRS code for a period of 16 months. However, the foundation was also instructed to continue to file as if it were a private foundation. Any possible issues pertaining to such filings can only be considered clerical errors and are in no way intended to be misleading, fraudulent, or criminal in any nature. Now, to understand, this actually adds even more questions to the situation. If your period ended December 31st, 2020, when you looked at the years 2021 and again 2022, according to their public filings here, right, that we have, what is seen over here is that this is still a P990 PF, or sorry, 990 PF form. Which again, according to the Internal Revenue Service, when you look at the annual filings and forms, I wish you put this link into your actual YouTube description. This would be important, Gerard. I feel like most people should be reading this. When you go to which form should I use? By going to this, they list numerous forms, the 990 PF, which is for private foundations, but importantly, the 990, the 990 EZ, and the 990 N. Again, reading into who should file the Form 990. So one of the tips that the IRS has given, ooh, they're going tip crazy here. A public charity described under Section 170B1A4 uh, that isn't within its initial five years of existence should first complete Part 2 or 3 of Schedule A, Form 990, to ensure that it continues to qualify as a public charity for the tax year. If it fails to qualify as a public charity, then it must file for a Form 990PF rather than a Form 990 or a Form 990EZ. So again, even looking into their letter that Gerard graciously provided, the 60-day period was from 2016 to 2020. Looking at the tax filings for 2016, 2017, 2018, one thing that isn't checked here, at least, is if the foundation is in a 60-month termination under Section 507B1B, check here. This is in 2016. You can see that in 2017, even, that tick wasn't filed. In 2018, that tick also wasn't filed. However, looking at the letter that Gerard provided, Dear Applicant, we received your notification of intent to terminate your private foundation status under IRC Section 507B1B during the 60-month period listed at the top of this letter. So even within that 60 month termination period under section 507 B1B, uh, this box wasn't ticked. So why wasn't this done again? And why wasn't in 2021 and 2022, these forms weren't filed under a standard 990 or a 990 EZ? 
Unless, of course, they went back to this private foundation designation and they're filing under this. Again, Gerard mentions something known as clerical errors, like, hey, there's nothing malicious about anything. These are just clerical errors. I want to remind you that this whole investigation was built upon looking at these various clerical errors. And again, the IRS, when I asked them to investigate or audit, it's not because of any malfeasance that I'm immediately, like, out of my investigation. It's me looking at these filings and asking even the IRS how they managed to let this go unchecked for so long. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in this entire situation, one thing I want to acknowledge now is the audit. Now, the audit was never the smoking gun during this video. And you might be like, whoa, what are you talking about, Muda? An audit literally exists to prove if you've got money sitting in an account. As of a week ago, roughly, the Open Hand Foundation donated $600,000 to the AFTD Foundation. Now, remember, if you look through the entire original investigations, even if you look into the very recent pieces where we looked into their golf revenues, Twitch revenues, IndieLand revenues, the question that I was raising to the table is that, honestly, I just need to see if the revenues all match up. There's no accusations of embezzlement as much as Gerard would like to mention. It's just more me trying to actually get some answers. Remember, charities are supposed to be open books, and they're supposed to itemize everything imaginable. The moment when you have buckets just listed as expenses and whatnot, the reason why an audit is asked for is just to make sure that that information is above board and it's all there. We believe we're done with selfish intent. They have directly jeopardized the safety of me, my staff, and my family, and that is not okay. I want to reiterate and specifically address that both the foundation and I have been accused of forgery, embezzlement, and charity fraud. The allegations imply the foundation forged tax returns because they weren't physical signatures on them when we e-filed them, or that we altered numbers to hide income or expenses. That, that holds weight though, that part. The under-reporting part is, is there, like, the math didn't math. That was proven. That was proven. The math did not math for the prior years. I'm not talking about this year because this year isn't finished. The return isn't filed yet for 23 because 23 is not over. We're talking about prior years. The math for prior years doesn't math based on reasonable assumptions made by calculating the price per admission for the golf tournament with related they, like they showed they showed the banner and it was like the the diamond level supporters or whatever which we know cost x amount of dollars there were this many of them and like a fourth grader could have done the math and realized there's money missing so yes there's you haven't proven anything about the years where it can be proven with with I mean, really, really solid. It's still, I say proven. There's very reasonable assumptions based on the information available. And after they've donated $600,000, I'm more inclined to believe that they could pass any audit from the DOJ or the IRS. But that doesn't exclude any of the charity fraud allegations whatsoever. And what I mean by that is the misleading statements that Gerard made throughout the course of IndieLand and on various podcasts. He briefly touches upon it during this entire response video. And he uses careful words like potentially misleading or I'm sorry you guys were, you guys felt misled. During several recent IndyLand events, press interviews and podcasts, I went on record saying where the money was going to and that the Open Hand Foundation had worked with various organizations. At different points, the foundation had been in communication with or considered several of them but it was not appropriate for me to make such statements when final actions had not yet been taken. The Open Hand Foundation's goal was to make a large impact by donating the money to the right place. And a lot of the conversations that were had with various organizations involved the funds not being restricted or came with extremely high administrative costs. Look, any way you say this, action needed to be taken. And to that point, I'm sorry. I'm disappointed that I was not more straightforward regarding the foundation's timeline for making donations and that I made statements potentially implying donations were made when they had not yet been. It took too long for clear action to occur and I apologize for all of this, but such inaction was not done for any selfish or malicious reasons. I want to take this opportunity to apologize to any developers, publishers, content creators, and special guests who were involved with the various events. I'm also very sorry to this year's IndieLand sponsor, 
Their team was incredibly supportive and were a great partner to work with. Most importantly, I want to apologize to anyone who ever donated over the years who felt they were wronged or led astray by any of this. Let's look at the actual statements once again, the statements that he never showed in his original video, and just see how potentially misleading those statements are. Brother and I started a foundation called the Open Hand Foundation that raises money for dementia research and treatment for organizations all over the world. Uh, we're soon going to be partnering up with the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, currently working with the University of San Francisco, and we're kind of one of their main um, their main funding uh, support partners uh, going into all of this. And that I made statements potentially implying donations were made when they had not yet been. Uh, all bits, all donations, all super chats, all YouTube memberships, basically anything that's tied to donating or subscribing in a financial way to us is going to charity. We're not touching any of it. It's all going for a good cause. Uh, we're going to have a great week and we have a lot of games. And that I made statements potentially implying donations were made when they had not yet been. Uh, all the money goes to the Open Hand Foundation, an organization that we started in honor of my mom. And all that money goes to Dementia Research. We don't touch any of it. We just work with the people who do need the money and we help them do their thing. And that I made statements potentially implying donations were made when they had not yet been. We are raising money for Dementia Research in honor of my late mom, trying to help folks who've been impacted by dementia, working with organizations like USF, uh, uh, F FTD Association of America, uh, Alzheimer's Association of America, and so many more. And then I made statements potentially implying donations were made when they had not yet been. Do our own version of that every year and kind of make it a cool celebration of of games and raise money for, a, you know, charity. And so he was like, I wish we had a charity that we could donate to. And I was like, oh, I, I run my own charity called the Open Hand Foundation and all the money that we aggregate. I mean, I started it when I was a young, a young boy with my dad in honor of my mom who had dementia. And so uh, we just, every year, we try and raise as much money as possible. And then we go work with, you know, Alzheimer's Association of America, University of San Francisco, um, Association for FTD, which is what my mom had, FTD. So we've like worked with big and small organizations across the board. And he was like, it'd be really cool if we did a show all about raising money for people who are making huge headways in, in dementia research and prevention and all that stuff. And I said, yeah, I'd love to. We have the organization to do it. We just, you know, need to come up with a theme. And so, yeah, I wouldn't say that people were potentially misled after statements as charged as that. Again, looking at the definition of charity fraud, fraudulent activity can occur when people make dishonest or inflated claims about how much money they've raised or how much it's helped the cause. And one of the common ways is pretending to be a charity or falsely claiming to be affiliated with a legitimate charity in order to solicit donations. We actually saw names that were being named. I'm surprised why Gerard didn't at least address this point. It was the most common, it was the heart of the argument, which just seems like it was deflected. And sure, he can say that I apologize to people who felt that they were misled. No, I, I don't think you can say that these are potentially misleading. Again, there is another statement in this that I want to get into, but let's look at the other evidence that Gerard has posted in his description real quick. The other response that Gerard gives is this one link right under the OHF termination of private status. There's no description to what this is, but opening this piece of evidence, it's the IRS extend time to assess excise taxes, which again is all related to the Open Hand Foundation being the taxpayer of, I guess, whatever redacted area this is. And again, this is the amount of liability for chapter 42 excise tax imposed on the taxpayer by section 4940 or 4945 of the Internal Revenue Code during the period January 1st, 2016 to 2020. And it may be assessed at any time on or before May 5th, 2025. So again, this is page two of two, and there's not actually a first page that I can see. What does this provide? Even watching Gerard's response video and scrubbing all the way through it like 10 times, I could not find this exact receipt shown. He put it in the description. I ask, what the fuck is it even there for? Cool, you asked for a consent to extend the time to assess miscellaneous excise taxes. That's great. It seems like you filed some continuation. Again, what relevance does this have to the public-private charity? It just exists there to exist. Then, of course, he provided the last piece of evidence, which, again, from his end, is the OHF audit. 
So here you can read that they've gotten this audit stamped, and again, April 12, 2016. What's important is they're literally looking at tax periods ending December 31st, 2014. Dear sir or madam, based on our audit of the tax periods listed above, you continue to qualify for exemption from federal income tax under Section 501c3 of the IRC. What bearing this has to the question of the uh, ch the charitable foundation after 2014, it makes no sense. Yeah, you were cool before 2014. I can actually acknowledge it because the IRS claims that based on their audit for the tax period, December 31st, 2014, that's when they ended assessing. You're good in gravy. And at the end of the day, even if they had a 2022 tax period ended, it would have absolutely quelled me personally when it comes to wondering about the money and the finances, because an audit literally just proves that the money was absolutely moved around properly. It would never actually address the main criticism, which is that the money was actually solicited through, uh, I would say, misleading statements, actual misleading statements. And I've shown you an amalgamation of it. One of those misleading statements is actually so bad that we're going to assess it once more. He mentions that the statements that he was making in regards to the IndyLand fundraiser, when he was up there talking about, yeah, we work with so-and-so organization. Yeah, we're so-and-so's funding partner. Uh, these were potentially implying that donations had been made when they had not yet been. That is fucking legally speak. And that is you literally trying to downplay actual misleading claims, which is where we looked into charity fraud as a definition. Again, I want to reiterate, charity Charity fraud, according to the legal match definition that I have over here, says that when someone takes advantage of a charitable or nonprofit organization for their own personal gain, fraud is defined as intentional deception or misrepresentation made for personal gain. Defrauding a charity can be anything from falsely claiming to be a victim of a disaster in order to get money from a charity or stealing donations from the collection tin. Fraudulent activity can also occur when the people make dishonest or inflated claims about how much money they've raised or how much it helps the cause. Some of the most common ways to commit charity fraud include pretending to be a charity or falsely claiming to be affiliated with a legitimate charity in order to solicit donations. Making false representations about the cause or the amount of money that will be donated to the cause. So again, if he was blatantly honest during IndyLand about, yeah, we're not actually donating the money this fucking year to AFTD and a lot of these organizations. We're just kind of stockpiling this money up so we can make a big restricted donation later. There would be no fucking story, okay? The whole story exists because people were misled into believing that their money was going year over year to charity when it was really just fucking sitting in an account. That's the real story right there. That's where the money was handled poorly. That's what is the proof that Gerard is not only deceptive in this situation, but he's also a poor steward of the fucking donation money, right? That's literally the actual crux of the argument. Now I wanna bring light into one specific statement that he made in particular that really hit me. Brother and I started a foundation called the Open Hand Foundation that raises money for dementia research and treatment for organizations all over the world. Uh, we're soon going to be partnering up with the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, currently working with the University of San Francisco, and we're kind of one of their main um, their main funding uh, support partners uh, going into all of this. So currently working with the University of San Francisco and we're one of the main funding partners for them, one of the main support partners. Think about the layers to that statement once again. Ladies and gentlemen, in IndyLand 2022, this is where this clip was from, he confirms that he's working with the UCSF. That's a confirmation right there. And even goes as far as to saying they're the main funding partners. That means that he has to know that they're actively sending money to this organization and they're sending money at such a level that they would be considered the upper echelons of the UCSF's donor owners in general. To, re to reiterate again, per the initial correspondence, Jacques Khalil, who represented the Open Hand Foundation, writing to us, mentions the UCSF as a historical contribution. So again, while they're still evaluating charities that fit their utopian worldview, somebody is fucking lying in this situation, okay? And for Gerard to publicly state that in 2022 is incredibly wrong. The definition of charity fraud that I keep reiterating involves when that fraudulent activity can occur when you make those dishonest or inflated claims about the money that is being raised and how much it has helped the cause and exactly what your organization is doing. Again, Gerard never played that fucking clip in his video. I don't know why. 
I feel like you should address this clip. If you made a misstatement, at least admit to the misstatement, right? It really felt like when they're talking about potentially misleading, I don't think it's potentially misleading. That's pretty fucking misleading. I'll just say, personally speaking. And again, to reiterate, from the original video is that if Gerard was honest about them raising money with the intention of stockpiling it for a larger donation, this wouldn't be an issue. But over the course of the last couple of years, the amount of misleading statements about his involvement with other organizations have been alarming. It's a clear contradiction to what he tells the public during his event versus what the organization at least told us privately in writing when we inquired about the situation from them, which is that they're still evaluating organization. They even asked if me and Carl investigating into this issue the situation would even recommend any charities to them. Like, dog, how the fuck would I re Why should I do your job for you is the question now I ask. But again, it's even worse when in the call he admits he found about all of this in 2022 and realized something was very wrong. I knew it was sitting there mm -hmm. at a certain point, and that's what me made me proactively go about it. Like, Do you know when that point was? I was made aware in 2021 when the, the, the money hadn't moved yet. Okay. And that's what made me go, that's not fucking cool. And that's what I got personally involved to move it. And did anyone, uh, 2021, last year, 2022. Yeah. Did anyone tell or, you that the, the, the money was going somewhere before then? Were you being misled? No, 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 no. No one told me anything. I was, I assumed that it was all going to a charity and I, I assumed incorrectly. So even after he found out in 2022, he proceeds to host IndieLand 2023 and a very recently on a Friends Per Second podcast admits that the open hand raises money and works with listed organizations while telling us in writing that they're still currently evaluating charities that fit their views. Do our own version of that every year and kind of make it a cool celebration of, of games and raise money for, a, you know, charity. And so he was like, I wish we had a charity that we could donate to. And I was like, oh, I... I run my own charity called the Open Hand Foundation and all the money that we aggregate. I mean, I started it when I was a young, a young boy with my dad in honor of my mom who had dementia. And so uh, we just every year we try and raise as much money as possible. And then we go work with, you know, Alzheimer's Association of America, University of San Francisco, um, Association for FTD, which is what my mom had FTD. So we've like worked with big and small organizations across the board and he was like it'd be really cool if we did a show all about raising money for people who are making huge headways and in, in dementia research and prevention and all that stuff and i said yeah i'd love to we have the organization to do it we just you know need to come up with a theme and so this is what i don't understand why can't he respond to this exact clip even this is well after around indie land 2023 after he's found out about this mishandling of money, okay? The fact that the money hasn't been going anywhere. Why does he continue to list actual names of these charities, by and large, while behind the scenes, as of like, what, a, a month ago? The actual written correspondence by Jacques Khalil literally came out and said to us that they were still evaluating charities, okay? Even Gerard admitted to us, I'm looking as forward as donating this money as soon as I can. I'm, I literally am, am, am about to like donate all this money today and, and, and prior to that earlier this week and the week before, and I've just been sitting here crippled trying to figure out the best way to handle this because I felt like if I donated the money, the minute you guys emailed me, it'd be a situation of, well, he's trying to hide it and he's admitting guilt by doing that. And right, right. I never felt that way, but I understand completely that you guys could easily argue that and it would just make me look more like a scumbag. So in this response, despite Gerard and his team chalking up these clerical errors, and even if they are financially and legally in the right, somehow he just still steps away from the organization's board. And he says that if IndieLand goes forward, he's taken away the charity component, as he clearly should. Gerard has been shown as a poor steward of the money that has been donated by his fans, and he has no reality being near a charity. Then he in this video mentions the point of electronic signatures as if that was a massive point in the original videos anyways. It wasn't. And why they don't have to be present like signatures on an electronic filing. And it makes sense. That's not even a damning accusation that was made, at least as far as my reporting had went. So I fail to see the relevance of why he made such a huge deal of it here. Now, in his entire response, he does claim that he was working with charities and organized, and they were in correspondence to discuss charities. And even in a discussion with us on a clip, he was in fact in communication. He wanted these charities to show up and, uh, you know, basically add the event and discuss themselves and the relation to the open hand. I mean, just listen to this. 
for us, it's like when you say that you've been in talks with these organizations, um, what do you mean like in talks? Is it like a long-term partnership? Couldn't you like have written them a check right there and then for uh, this specific year and then year after year, like the money comes in and out? Yeah, the, the idea was we wanted to donate the money to an organization so that they could send a, a representative or, or someone from their organization to come forward and talk about all the good that we've done working with them and making them like the new benefactor that we've been looking for or, or multiple benefactors, depending on, mm -hmm. on the amount of money that was donated. So if he has this correspondence, please produce the email receipts, right? At the end of the day, he made this response video that was apparently possessed with all these receipts if I'm to believe people on Twitter. And in reality, there are four pieces of evidence that he put in the description. He never showed a single email chain in his video that proves that he was in communication with these organizations. That's all you needed to shut me and Carl up or anybody that was accusing you. Just show the fucking receipts. You know why we showed the call and, and, and our correspondence with the Open Hand Foundation, the emails, the written statements in our previous videos, it's because without receipts, our claims have no validity. You cannot take what I say at surface value. If I don't provide receipts, you, as a viewer, should question me on any statement that I make. That's just logical. Again, for Gerard to make this video without providing any of these receipts and downplaying the misleading statements that he made is so fucking legally, like it's just legalese at this point. Again, if you had evidence of your discussions with these organizations, please present an email correspondence with these organizations. So then he mentions the unrestricted restricted donation types, which again, we were mentioning throughout the course of this investigation, um, especially towards after the first initial video. So he mentions the difference between donation types, how restricted donations typically are going towards specific causes in a charity versus unrestricted donations that the charity, when you give it to them, are fully allowed to take, it, like whatever, they're fully allowed to allocate that money wherever it goes. So why didn't he mention in his own video, again, let me play it, when he says that his foundation raised funds in an unrestricted manner with the intention to restrict donations. The Open Hand Foundation raised funds in an unrestricted manner with the intention to restrict a larger donation towards dementia research. Larger restricted donations ensure clear measures and direction, but can take time. So again, why wasn't this mentioned in any public event? If you found out things were wrong in 2022, why didn't in IndieLand 2023, did you make a public statement that said, yeah guys, the money that I thought was being sent, it's actually still with us, but we are actually planning to send it in a restricted donation. So we just need to raise more money and then we can send it all as one lump sum and do some serious change and move the needle, quote unquote. Why did you not just say that? If you were honest, we wouldn't have a story to cover. The fact that this wasn't relayed and you still mentioned charities as of weeks ago, you still mentioned these charities when you were still evaluating them, evaluating them to us in writing is clear misstatements to the public. You should have been very forthcoming about all of this. And again, why is it that you're so cool talking about this in your response video when literally about a month ago, if you were go back to our Discord call together, all three of us, you said, that's not fucking cool when you found out about the situation and you got personally involved to move it. I knew it was sitting there mm -hmm. at a certain point and that's what me made me proactively go about it. Like, Do you know when that I point was? I was made aware in 2021 when the, the, the money hadn't moved yet. Okay. And that's what made me go, that's not fucking cool. And that's what I got personally involved to move it. And... Did anyone? Uh, 2021, last year, 2022. Yeah. Did anyone tell you that the, the the money was going somewhere before then? Were you being misled? No, 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 no. No one told me anything. I was. I assumed that it was all going to a charity, and I, I assumed incorrectly. Again, if this was the intention <laughs> to have a mass restricted donation, why not just tell us in the call? Either you lied to us then, or you're lying to us now. And what about this point where you wanted somebody to come out and talk up your event as well too? It doesn't sound like that's part of a restricted donation. It sounds like you were looking for a partnership where I guess you were both benefiting each other from a public relations standpoint. Why wasn't this mentioned in this? If your long-term goal is a restricted donation, why are we digging up and looking at constant contradictions to that intended goal? 
Why are you shocked that the money is there? You could have told us in that Discord call, hey guys, the money is supposed to be there. We're just building it up for a restricted fund. There can only be one truth. And I ask if this was truly a long-term intention that you should have calmly relayed to us in a Discord call that we had, and this would have easily quelled me, instead you chose to tell me, that's not fucking cool when you find out, right? And also, I just want to ask about the full call itself. Uh, I don't have any issues releasing this full call. If Gerard is okay and Carl are okay consenting to releasing this call in full, I personally don't care. This call should be out if these people feel comfortable. Again, the only reason that call was not released is because there is some off the record components of the call in regards to the mother of the situation. This new narrative doesn't really work when Gerard refers to us in that call, and this is a clip you've never heard yet, where he refers that we were one of the primary reasons the money needed to be moved and why they were looking at moving the money as quick as they did. You don't believe me, right? I have a receipt right here, listen to it. Yeah, that makes okay. sense. So as of now, the money, as far as your understanding, that six hundred sixty thousand dollars, roughly, is still sitting in your like that that charity account, waiting for a benefactor at the right time. Uh, I mean, as of this week, we've been we've been having conversations about moving it as early as as today or tomorrow, just because the pressure I got from you guys. If I'm being quite honest, um, mm -hmm. not that I was trying to save face, but like this is a a private fight that I've been dealing with for months with my family. And I, I even told my family, Hey, this is the last Indian land I'm ever going to do. Cause this is the 10th year anniversary of my mom's passing. And, uh, when I kind of found all this information out, I was very unhappy with what things were going. And, um, you know, the ramifications mm -hmm. of this are going to be massive for everything I've ever done in the space. And, so we were apparently one of the main reasons and there was a private fight with the dad and the family. If the money was always intended to be restricted, why the fuck would you not relay this to any of us in that call, all right? We would have literally, I would have probably believed you and said, ah, oh, it's probably a restricted donation. Well, you should probably have been more forthcoming about that to the public. But when you keep telling us privately how when you found out that's not fucking cool, this is a private fight between my dad, family and whatnot. Again, it really sounds like you guys aren't on the same page, really. So I, I ask, what is the truth of the situation? So inside this, he mentions the fundraiser foundation's expenses explicitly include the golf fundraiser and indie land operational costs and various fees for the last nine years have totaled up to $178,951.17. We're getting down to the pennies at this point. The foundation's expenses include costs for the golf fundraiser and indie land operational costs, and various fees, totaling for $178,951.17 worth of expenses over the last nine years. It's also factually inaccurate that all the money the foundation received in 2023 is unaccounted for. Now, I don't know why he's jumping to 2023. Even in my most recent video, when I talk about the donation that they made the $600,000, uh, the closest I even go into it when I mention, of course, the audit is that obviously I want to know the full accounting of the money there. Because they made those donations, I do firmly believe that they could probably pass the audit. They obviously have the funds and I believe that they probably are sitting in their account, okay? I just want to see a full breakdown. As they are a public charity, they should give an exact dollar amount. These books should not be pried from their hands. They should be opened in their hands, so to speak. But ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to the 2023 funds, the $600,000 that they're giving, obviously isn't the complete amount. There still needs to be an audit done on their charity just for various other income sources to be properly audited, assessed. But the thing about this whole thing that I'm also wondering is the money that is probably raised from something like IndieLand 2023, which we haven't even seen reflected in the books, but obviously would be part of their accounting, should be donated, at least hopefully in due time, to the other charities that were named too. Remember, donating to charity, in my opinion, isn't enough. You should be donating to the charities you've listed and named. Because remember, if their name was good enough to publicly use, uh, then you should be, you should absolutely ethically donate to them uh, no matter what the amount is, just give money to these charities. Remember, that's what it's all about. Um, the most I could even say about that is obviously that's going to be part of the mix, but you can't speculate or even like assume, which you shouldn't be doing in the first place, but you can't even reasonably jump into 2023. Why? Because there's no actual filing yet of 2023. To jump down and start breaking down the expenses 
and revenues and whatnot for 2023, a year that hasn't been publicly filed and is up for download and view for the public record is just something that would be blatantly wild speculation, which is why jumping into that was pointless. There's plenty of information from 2014 to 2022 that you can reasonably assess and you know, come to reasonable conclusions. I don't know why Gerard is jumping to 2023. It might be just the fact that this is a complicated business situation. But again, why not stick to the focus of 2019, 2021, 2022, where, you know, the actual assessments, at least by your accusers, as you claim, is actually being made. Now, in this video, I just want to stress for the record, when it came to the golf tournament, some of the money that was pledged was apparently by Gerard and their own their own statements could have been rolled over into following years, right? Which absolutely is something that could happen, and I'm glad they clarified it. Again, the fact that he's out here mentioning numbers down to the penny shows that there is a QuickBooks, some accounting that's present. So I would be very much like down to see these actual statements, a bank statement. Uh, uh, an expense sheet. If you're itemizing and you're down to the dollar, clearly you have this information. And I'm not, I mean, I just want to see it. I think most people want to see it. And you're a public charity, you should be showing it. It shouldn't be pried from your hands. So again, it contradicts on what these filings have even been for the last nine years, where again, according to their actual filings, we're looking at somewhere around $125,000. So these are expenses that I tabulated up from 2015. Remember 2014 actually had no uh, expenses. So this all adds up to 125,395. Remember he said very clearly in the last, in the last nine years. So 2015, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now again, obviously being a public charity, they're probably they probably have a shortfall in expenses in 2023, which I'm sure we'll see in the filings if if we're going by 9 years as in we're including 2023. Again, if you added 2014 as the first of the 9 years, it would be $0. So again, you have the books, you have the accounting, just again, if you could show us the receipts, that's all anybody would have asked. It would easily shut people up. Another key mention here is when he talks about the Twitch bits and subscriptions. And along with merch and various sales, these offset production costs. Income from Twitch subscriptions and bits, along with merchandise, have offset some of the production costs. So to say the money is missing is simply wrong. Also to be clear, IndieLand does not make money on YouTube. We typically stream only on Twitch. And when we did simulcast to YouTube, we made little to no money. If we actually look into the IndieLand branding right here, you can see that when it comes to uh, at least IndieLand 2023 and IndieLand 2022, on the branding on their own public videos on YouTube, they write that all bit subs donations go to the Open Hand Foundation, right? So all bit subs donations, all of that touches the Open Hand Foundation. They also mentioned that simulcasting to YouTube, they made little to no money. Again, what is little to no money? That could mean a lot of, that's a pretty subjective statement. Is it $0? Is it like $50? What is the accounting there? And here's the thing, there were no receipts of any of these income sources, right? We never saw like a year by year receipt of how many Twitch bits they made, the cut that went to Amazon and all of this shit. We're just supposed to take him at his word. And it contradicts when he said none of that money he makes from Twitch or any of these sources goes to them. They take 0% and not a penny. So how can you publicly say you're not touching a single penny from this money? And then now in a response video claim that, yeah, some of it is offsetting production costs. Come on, don't you guys know? Income from Twitch subscriptions and bits along with merchandise have offset some of the production costs. Uh, all bits, all donations, all super chats, all YouTube memberships, basically anything that's tied to donating or subscribing in a financial way to us is going to charity. We're not touching any of it. It's all going for a good cause. Uh, we're going to have a great weekend. We have a lot of games. He then brings up the golf tournament and plays a portion of Carl's video. He doesn't play a portion from my video in specific when I delve into the years of 2019, 2021, and 2022, where I skip 2020 because the golf tournament doesn't occur because it shows up in various photo streams for every other year but 2020, which is most likely due to the fact that COVID lockdown, especially in California, prevented people from coming together. So you can excuse 2020. So he mentions the accusers alleged money is missing, but he claims the books reconcile this and the accusations are a result of bad math, quote unquote. So speaking for myself, when I was assessing their charity, I actually gave tons of leeways to them in factoring and processing fees and basically lowballing as much as I absolutely could. I didn't decide to make any statements of fact 
in that entire assessment. I was just looking at four pillars of revenue sources, right? Which again, was a topic of real contention publicly after Gerard's video came out. So to understand, my point is that reasonably, I was just seeing if the revenue listed on the Open Hand Foundation's public tax filings was absolutely 100% definitive. So I had four income sources, right? The Tiltify donation, which goes right from Tiltify to the Open Hand Foundation's bank account, the grants from Jamie Lee Curtis, and the possible difference of money that, again, looking at their own goddamn branding from 2022 and 2023, all bit subs and donations go to the Open Hand Foundation. So yes, they are all getting sent to the Open Hand Foundation and they should be shown as revenue. Again, then I also looked into the golf revenue and what the mismatch I found was when I added the Tiltify and the Jamie Lee Curtis, the amount of money that could reasonably be given as a leeway to the golf uh, you know, re revenues and the uh, Twitch YouTube revenues, that seemed a bit suspicious to me. Now, this is a key point that Gerard can use to provide the books and shut any speculation or any assumptions out completely. Remember, if anybody has the hardline proof for the books, it's him and he can provide those receipts. So in this video, he claims the 2019 Indian Land net proceeds were $82,409.19. The 2019 Indian Land's net proceeds were $82,409.19. Now, the information we used was $109,418, which are the 2019 preliminary total earnings. Again, if you want to get into the definition of preliminary net income or preliminary earnings, it's a term used to refer to the total expected net income of a business and organization before any final adjustments are made. Now, again, if you had this number, $82,409.19, you clearly have it. Why don't you show us an actual accounting of it? Why don't you show us the actual receipt on the video? He doesn't, he just gives us a number and expects me to just reasonably believe it. Which again, looking at all of the misstatements he's made, how am I reasonably supposed to take anything this man says as gospel? And again, why wasn't this posted at all? Again, I tried to look up this number, $82,409.19, just to see if IndieLand actually amended this and made another public post about the 2019 earnings. I seriously couldn't find any actual post about IndieLand 2019 and $82,409. Uh, $82, so again, why wasn't this updated? Again, if you have the numbers, please show the exact receipt of it. Then he also mentions the revenue from the golf tournament is $31,371.55. And when combined with $31,371.55 in revenue from the golf tournament and $10,000 from a direct supporter, it adds up to $123,780.74. Again, if you have the revenue for it, please provide a receipt. He doesn't provide anything on the screen or in the description of the video. So anybody that says, but Muda, there's a lot of receipts here. Where the fuck are they? Are they in the room with me? I can't see them. How can anybody say that he provided a tangible receipt when he doesn't show anything on the screen, when it doesn't show anything link in the description below? It literally requires you to take this man's word, which over the course of this whole investigation has shown you should do anything but take his word without actual receipts. And again, I try to use as many sources that I can to reasonably deduce these revenue sources. Like I said, when I looked at their 2022, 2023 Indie Land and saw all bit subs donated, donations go to the Open Hand Foundation. It wasn't me mistakenly assuming that things should be reflected on its revenue. I really did attempt my very best at trying to identify the possible revenue sources for that low-balled math that I did. You can say bad math, but again, I am low-balling based on what I can reasonably deduce. I'm not trying to claim that you embezzled, he's using the E word a whole lot over here. I'm not claiming that you're embezzling millions of dollars. That's a very serious claim to be making. But I am reasonably suspicious about the reported revenues. And that's something that can easily be rectified had you provided a receipt, which according to this video in general, he has not provided any tangible receipt for that at all, when he should have, in my opinion. So throughout this, when he mentions the $125,000 administration costs, he uses the word embezzlement again. I never claimed that word. And throughout this entire investigation, he constantly keeps using the E word in this situation. If anything, I looked at the expense buckets in those filings and questioned why they're just buckets. What he did in this video is actually start itemizing expenses. As for what the costs are to run an event like this, there are event organizers, venue expenses, crafts and catering, event dinners, support staff, production equipment, rentals, event brand and merchandise, security, insurance, 
And so you clearly know that you're itemizing your expenses. Like for instance, the golf charity, which he claims, hey, listen, we have to pay for insurance. We have to pay for security. We have to pay for the event venue. You know what that is? That's itemizing your expenses. So instead of writing, I spent $5,000 in a golf tournament in 2023, break that shit down. Tell us, you're a public charity. This should be given. You should be breaking this down, especially when it comes to running a charity like this. Why you have not provided any receipt is insane. So throughout this investigation too, he claims that it's not illegal to hold funds. And no one claimed that it's actually illegal to hold funds. What the claim here is, is you never made it readily apparent that you were stockpiling for a restricted donation. Clearly to the audience you were soliciting these public donations from. Had you done this, there would be no story. He plays a portion of my video where I bring up the 5% rule to private foundations, and then he talks and questions that, hey, we're actually a public charity, so this doesn't apply to us. How can I, Gerard, reasonably believe that they were public, a public charity, when their own filings in 2021, 2022 didn't even reflect that? He releases some letter today thinking that it's supposed to exonerate him, a, I'm not a clairvoyant. I don't know that letter until today. And also, even looking at that letter, like I mentioned at the beginning, there's other questions that are raised. According to your filings now, because of that letter you released, why don't your 2021 and 2022 filings reflect a change to a public charity? Why don't you specifically mention that you were under a 60 month termination period throughout the years that you were under that 60 month termination period? These are questions that I have to ask. Again, Gerard can say clerical errors, but that's why audits happen because there are fucking clerical errors and they need to not be clerical errors. So then there's another situation here too. He claims that on a dollar raise from Indyland ever went to benefit him, clearly contradicting how he used those Twitch donations to offset the event expenses, despite clearly claiming he never touched any of that money and it all went to charity. Again, how can anyone take that shit differently whatsoever? He spends the next part of this getting like visibly heated and he mentions charity fraud and starts mentioning other allegations too, like embezzlement and uh, what is it, the um, forgery. But again, I wanna just whittle this back to the definition of charity fraud. Again, misrepresented statements during IndyLand are incredibly serious. And going back to even the one statement he made about the UCSF and them being the main funding partners, that clearly contradicts what the open hand wrote to us. Again, he keeps mentioning embezzlement when that wasn't even the point. No one is claiming that you're embezzling or even cooking the books. <clears throat> Now, that's a pretty serious claim to be making in regards to embezzlement and forgery and everything. But I want to whittle it instead of letting this whole situation conflate out the charity fraud, which, again, audits, even if they happen, and even if every dollar is properly accounted for, which, like I said earlier, given the fact that they made a donation, I'm sure that they could actually beat an audit. But just because you beat an audit doesn't mean you're clear out of the situation. The principal complaint, the principal accusation here, was the fact that there was charity fraud. Misstatements were happening. You were raising money without properly declaring the intentions and the goals of this charity. You had mentioned directly working with actual other charitable organizations or groups, misrepresented those situations. And again, I hate to see that this situation is slowly being ignored. Like that point, it really felt like in this 19 minute response was barely addressed. You can't just say, oops, I'm sorry that that happened. You can't just say that you made uh, potentially misleading statements when I've played statements here that are not potentially misleading as far as my beliefs go, as far as my understanding goes. And even when it comes to misrepresentations, again, please re listen to the exact you know, clips that you yourself made on your own streams. That's the question that I want to bring it back to. That was the principal argument, and again, you stockpile those donations. You, I guess, want to retcon the story and say it was always your intention for uh, restricted donations. When in reality, even your Discord call with us, you had made it pretty much apparent that, hey, <laughs> when I found out in 2022, I was like, that's not fucking cool. You mentioned a private argument between your family, your father, and you about this entire situation. So evidently, it doesn't seem like you guys were on the same page. But even beyond all of it, the principal reason for why this money appears to be donated, and one of the principal reasons, not the entire reason, was because we applied a lot of pressure, as you mentioned in the call. Me and Carl, Carl specifically, who first sent a letter to your organization, lit a fire under your guys' ass. And at the end of the day, look, I don't care if I'm like a villain or you want to paint me as a villain or a bad guy because I looked into this situation. You can fucking puff your chest out all you want. 
But if being the bad guy means putting somebody like you to task and making sure that this donation even happened in the first place, and now people who were suffering from Alzheimer's finally have some extra gas in the tank to fight the debilitating condition that they have, then I guess if that makes me the bad guy, goddamn, I guess I'm the bad guy. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't really, you know, uh, rip away sleep for me. And at the end of the day, when it comes to this entire situation of potential litigation, which, uh, again, a lot of people have said that there's a lawsuit. Look, it's America. You can sue God if you wanted to, okay? It's the land of the lawsuit. And there's no perfect time to ever get sued. Nobody likes getting sued. Nobody likes suing. But the thing about lawsuits is, obviously, he was saying that the family is looking into it. I don't know what the future for that is. But at the end of the day, charity fraud is the principal argument that we wanted to see addressed and we failed to see properly addressed in this situation. You can't just put a Band-Aid on it and say, ooh, ooh, oopsie, and deflect and mention irrelevant points at the end of the day. Because this, this response that he made wasn't filled with crazy receipts. A lot of the people on the internet that were like, wow, there's so many fucking receipts in this. Watch the whole video again. Please show me where the receipts are. Where did you see a bank statement? Where did you see any evidence of money flow? In fact, even looking in the description, tell me how many of those pieces of evidence really actually move the needle and exonerate him in this entire situation of making misleading statements. You know, accusing anybody of slander. There is no malicious intent over here. We wanted to make sure the money was donated to the right place. And at the end of the day, it seems like the money is donated to the right place. Should misleading statements have been made? No. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. This is me, Mudahar, and uh, yeah, I'm out.